Hello, my name is Brian Healy. I'm a fourth year PhD student in speech communication at Southern Illinois University, and welcome to Critical Praxis. Today I will be talking with you about the role that fat, critical fat studies plays in my life. And for once, that role is not just a pun about the thing underneath my chin or on my belly. I digress. In the past few years, I have began to drift closer and closer to fat studies because of the work I do as a performer and a performance study scholar. As I move forward, I'm drawn both towards and away from the work of fat studies, specifically due to the use of the word fat in fat studies. I believe in the work in the field of fat studies, and I care about the researchers and the research being done. But I question the use of the word fat as the foundation for the field. Here, I point to the way in which we construct fat, seeing as everyone has fat or adipose tissue. How is it possible to differentiate between fat and fat bodies then? Unlike other groups, the characteristics that define the differentiation is not wholly tangibly different, like race, class, or gender. It's possible for everybody to believe they are fat in society, especially in the type of society like the U.S. And, and thus, how can we reclaim a word that anyone can use? I mean, it can't be a know-it-when-you-see-it situation. And I also worry that it's, it's divisive. So for me, instead of fat studies, I, I posit a shift towards a body politic of size. Here the body is taken as inherently political, while noting that the large bodies deal with issues of discrimination, hatred, violence, acceptance, and multiple others. It represents, as Benny notes Audre Lorde in his call, that there is a mythical norm which is fully unobtainable. And being so, we need to look at the body in its multiple shapes and differentiating sizes as a point for coalition and advocacy, not for a call for animosity or us versus them binary mentality. Using a body politic of size does not just erase the fat or adipose body, but looks towards embracing a polyvocal approach to the body outside and within body image. This may seem radical or like a terrible shift, but I'm, I'm just using this opportunity and opening as, as a thought experiment for me and for you all about something that is actually personally an issue of mine. Uh, so thank you for bearing with me. Now, I'd like to talk to you about the work that has really been interesting me lately. Being a large white heterosexual male, I've recently found the work covering the large male body to be lacking much critical reflection specifically when weighed to the amount, the great amount of work dealing with women's bodies and representations throughout multiple uh, media. This is where I find myself. As I move to theorize the large male body, I begin looking at the performances of that body through representations in television and film. Specifically, I interrogate the ways television sitcoms repetitiously construct my body type in distinct and problematic ways from the inception of television programming to the current and present uh, norms. I would note as well that there are representations of large male bodies in films all over the place and all throughout film history. But intelligent vision from Jackie Gleason as Ralph Cramden to the currently running Mike and Molly with Billy Gardell as Mike Biggs we see a constructed masculine identity that is constantly called into question because of its size. Here we see that a large man must fulfill a set of characteristics that are essentialist in nature. Specifically, these bodies are working class, they're boorish, they're uh, insensitive, they're food-oriented or food-addicted, uh, they're bad parents, they're lazy, they're uneducated, undereducated, and uh, the list of problematic behaviors continues to abound. Here we see the ways which the large male body is supposed to act in order to fit the normative and normalizing narratives of masculinity. 
In Josh Mosher's Setting Free the Bears, Refiguring Fat Men on Television, we get a good sense of the historical construction of these narratives by noting the ways large male characters on television shows move from blue-collar job to blue-collar job, shifting from people like Ralph Cramden as a bus driver to uh, Carol O'Connor's character on uh, All in the Family as a, as, a, uh, as a factory worker to Mark Addy in Still Standing or uh, Jim Belushi as a con- construction worker or uh, Homer Simpson has a, a rather menial job or Peter Griffin constantly losing their jobs. Uh, we see the lack of education and we see a role... Uh, for the mentality or thought process of a large male to be rather finite or small. And so for me, the sitcom stays consistent across television history and its representation of the large male body, teaching society how to engage with a large or fat body. And this is why I look toward the sitcom because of the format's implicit pedagogical value, meaning that audiences learn their cues for reaction to circumstances and personal experience through things like laugh tracks and those oh moments and repetitious imagery. We also get that finite set of situations where the large body is represented. The the character may be different slightly, but only slightly. Now, some may argue that by Being a comedy, the sitcom doesn't have a responsibility to reflect the large male body in a positive light. And maybe they don't, but I would respond by saying that we need to be cognizant of the ways media creates the means for our domination. Especially when we believe that that thing has little value or is low art. Because usually that's code for it has the largest audience. Or that it plays to the lowest common denominator, which in turn means that it teaches the largest part of society how to make sense of things. Here is specifically, how do we treat a large male body, right? And for me personally, this then asks, how do I as a large man fit into society? If these are the images, right? How should I act in this society? Am I performing myself correctly by these standards? All these questions arise when I look at sitcoms. Now, if we specifically look at Bill Gardell's work and Mike and Molly, uh, we see a Chicago City police officer who's addicted to food, who is insensitive and doesn't understand women, who lives alone, who is a klutz, right? For example, the first episode of Mike and Molly, uh, the cold open, we reveals... Mike and his partner sitting in the front seat of their squad car. And Mike's out of breath, and his partner begins to ridicule Mike about losing his hat to a a large gust of wind in Chicago, you know, the Windy City. And he has to chase the hat. Now, we we never see him chase the hat. And so here's the joke, is that, that Mike constantly loses his hat because his head's too fat, and that's funny. But also, we're supposed to laugh because a fat man chasing something down the street is going to look awkward and thus be hilarious. Ha ha. And the thing is that we don't see Mike physically chase his hat, which should be the joke. But instead, it's so historically ingrained in our minds that fat man chases something. It's funny. And this, this kind of makes my point. The work of the sitcom is to socially condition the audience to respond in specific ways to large men's bodies. And for the most part, that's not a really positive way. And if you're a large man and you're watching this, then you can think of maybe the ways in which self-deprecation tends to work as a weapon to guard the body uh, from any sort of outside stimuli that, that tries to point out uh, bad things about you. Now, before I go, I would like to switch gears and just momentarily talk about the issue Benny brought up at the end of his call. I really want to continue to question the ways large men's bodies and large women's bodies find acceptance or unacceptance in uh, society. Now, I agree with Benny that large women have a difficult time, and I do not want to deny any of the trouble women's bodies have in society. But I'd like to trouble the idea that men can let themselves go. 
Because this seems to me not only a problematic statement that reifies a negative view of large male bodies, but also it perpetuates the idea that, to me, that, that men don't have to think about their bodies in the ways that women do. While I will say that there is a tight, tight lens focusing on women's bodies and women's body image. This in turn means that there is a vast amount of work researching, discussing, theorizing those women's bodies. And there is just a plethora of, of writing out there right now that's being produced about large women's and not as much about men. Not only to mention the socially acceptable spaces where women's, uh, large women's bodies uh, can feel free to find clothing, like Lane Bryant or Fashion Bug, and other plus-size venues, which are found in almost every mall in America. And, and I'm not going to say that these spaces aren't on their own problematic, because they're very problematic as well. But personally, when I have to go two and a half hours away from where I live to find clothing that fits me in a store that's off the beaten path in a big city as kind of hidden behind other things, I begin to wonder how, how accepted I, my large male body is in society. And so here I think that this implicit, the implicit nature of, of large male bodies or the, the untalked about kind of shunning of us or hiding of the large male body's clothing or stores uh, or the ways in which we construct a large man to not talk about his size is really a, a, a great space for us to start the theorization on the large male body. And, and I, want, I want to help engender this feeling for hopefully other men that may be watching this. Uh, large men or men who know large men who are interested in this. Uh, I, I would like to thank you all for your time today. Uh, I appreciate uh, this experience. Thank you very much, Benny, for the opportunity to entertain these uh, thought experiments in a public forum. Uh, this is a, a great uh, space for all of us to come together as intellectuals and academics. I hope you have a great and wonderful week. Thank you for watching Critical Prices.